Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey. Hey, Gary. We got John a good Horner. show today. Yeah, sure I'm doing do. okay. You, you mm-hmm. too? Yeah. So yeah. I, so- I, 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 I got to say this. Now, we don't, we don't do the history stuff anymore, but I, I noticed that today, January 26, 2010, a storied brand in the auto industry. It was the beginning of the end. When of a, Je- you're going to guess what? what uh, of what did you say? 1910? No, 2010. Oh, 2010. The end of a storied brand. Ooh, I'm going to guess that that is probably Pontiac. Saab. Saab. Oh, okay. so so General General Motors announced that they were selling Saab to Spiker and. Yeah. That was basically and that was that she, that was basically That's all right. she wrote, and uh, I was astonished to see how much General Motors had actually paid for Saab. They initially put, paid six hundred million dollars for half of it, and then another one hundred and twenty-five million to get the whole thing. And when they sold it to Spiker, they sold it for seventy-four million dollars in cash and three hundred and twenty million dollars worth of Spiker stock. You can imagine what that was Gee. worth. So. Yeah. Right. Anyway, <laughs> it's too bad that that brand is gone. Yeah. No, I would agree. They 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 did some cool cars in their day. Absolutely. Well, hey, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, driver in the loop and and a whole new approach to developing cars that maybe can get rid of prototypes. Certainly, get a whole a rid of a whole lot of them. Later in the show, we'll be talking about the Corvette E Ray. And uh, the reason that we're going to be talking about those, and we'll bring them up now, we've got Michael Hoffman from VI Grade coming in from Germany with us today. And we got Don Sherman, who probably knows more about the Corvette program than anyone outside of the Corvette program. And we'll be getting into that later today, too. So hello, Michael and Don. Hello. Good afternoon. Looking forward to it. Good. So, Michael, yeah, let's start off with VI grade and what you guys do. You build different types of driving simulators that will allow development engineers to do a lot of development in the virtual world. And so, I mean, is this a reality? Can you get rid of all the prototypes or what do you think? I think that that's at least what we're that, that's the aim. <laughs> but I would be lying if, if I were to say uh, we're already there yet. And uh, no, it's it's a journey that uh, we think a journey which really can change the way how people develop cars today. So if you if you look a little bit, it's, you know, we have had a lot. We talked about history, 2010 and earlier, even earlier, people started with computer at a design. And there were a lot of other digital initiatives. And I think all of them were aiming to get rid of the prototypes. But none of them really succeeded. You know, you can do crash worthiness, durability, and these kind of things with CAE. But when it comes to what's the driving experience, CAE can't tell this. And you know, it's, if you, for example, if you look at a BMW commercial, they have a big, they say, driving is believing. And I think that's still the mindset also in not only BMW, we'll talk about the Corvette and other companies. It's a lot of development engineers only believe, okay, this, is, this car is now good for the customer if they drive it. And so Michael, what what's weird. the... What's the difference today? Because driving simulators are not new. They've been around for a while. What's different with what VI Grade's doing? I think the if you look at this, the, yes, they have been around. But have they really been part of the main mainstream development process? I wouldn't say so. And, and I think what we are doing different, or let's say what our customers are now doing different, is the technology has matured. And now they make it part of the mainstream, that process. But, you know, it's in, in past, driving simulators were, were maybe used to answer specific questions. But they were not used really to say, OK, I have 10 different sets of tires. Which is the one which gives me the best driving experience? I have different pushing combi- uh, or damper characteristics. 
which feels better or different exhaust systems, which sounds better. These are the kind of things which our customers are now doing. So, what- so okay, if, if, if we go back to what you were saying earlier, so, so before 2010, they were using CAD, computer-aided design, so they're designing the vehicle, and and yeah. so they got the solid modeling and so on. So I mean, it looked it looked photorealistic. It looked like a real car. Mm-hmm. Then we went to CAE, computer-aided engineering, and there you could put the the wind over the car. You could determine fluid flow. You could you could do things like like that. So, is what you're talking about when we're talking about driving simulations? So that unit that's behind you, that somebody climbs in this, Mm -hmm. and you're able to put in all of the data that defines the vehicle so that when they are behind the steering wheel and they have pedals, that they're actually able to feel exactly as they would in a real car? Uh, Let's say exactly. Uh, Let's say they feel it real enough that they can make the right uh, design decision. That they can say, okay, this or basically, you know, in a lot of cases, it's A to B comparison. That they can look, okay, I have two different design alter- alternatives. Which one feels better? And you know, for us, the driving simulators, basically, you need to do three things. It's you need to feel the movement, whether the movement is correct. At the same time, you have to coordinate it with what you see. So you need to have realistic animation. You see here a little picture from, I think it's from Ann Arbor. And um, and then you also need to hear the right things. And, you know, and we're, we're trying to bring these three things together so that your driving experience becomes real. For example, you also see here on the seat, there are some active belts. You know, that we also give the driver an additional cue. So when, when you brake, you know, then we push on the belts that you get this experience. Okay, I'm de- decelerating. Or we have other driving simulators where you also feel the vibrations on your pedals, on your seat, in the back, on the steering wheel. So all of this aimed to make it more realistic. Michael, I think one of the important points is, as, as you uh, alluded to already, is you can do A to B comparisons. And so uh, let's just say somebody's doing a suspension setup. Mm-hmm. They can quickly jump from one setting to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. Whereas in the real world, you'd more than likely have maybe several cars with different settings, or you would set it up and then somebody would decide they have to make a change and you'd have to put it up on a hoist and change the springs and the bushings and things like that. So your simulator is able to help an engineer get to an answer far more quickly than they could with real hardware. Correct, correct. Uh, I think it's, so if you listen to the people who run these kind of simulators, so let's say sometimes they run uh, 50 different configurations on one day. So I think very difficult to achieve uh, on, a, on a real car. And it's also, let's say, you know, it, it is like <laughs> uh, Gary is also wearing glasses. You know, when you go to, uh, you want to have new classes and they also do this A to B comparison. So is this better or this better? Or can you, and then sometimes I'm confused. And I say, can you go back? And you know, and that's the thing on a driving simulator. You also can do these things very fast. And it's not like on a test track. So maybe uh, you also uh, have bad luck. It starts to rain, okay? And then then you're done with your testing and then you have to wait for the next day. So, so Michael, I, Michael I, I, sorry, go ahead, Gary. I was gonna say, Michael, so so l- let's say there's a, a engineer listening who's highly skeptical mm-hmm. and he basically says, yeah, I know what simulators are and they have racing simulators and you know F1 drivers are using simulators and they're driving around, but you know, I, I'm worried about suspension setup. So I, I need to know, you know, the, the durometer of the jounce bumper. I need to know the spring rate. Mm. Um, wh- where do the physics come from? I mean, how do you how do you get this information into your system so that it, it really is close to reality? You know, this uh, requires work. <laughs> so, 
basically we use the data from the CAE engineers. And so I think in most cases, okay, a vehicle dynamics model is an Adams model or, or a Simpac model or something like this. And we basically then extract the data into our system, which can, it's important, it needs to run in real time, otherwise you're lost. And, uh, and then you have to also tune the model, you know, that uh, also particularly the steering system so that you have the right steering feed. So it's, it's math behind this, it's math and, and the data which comes, let's say we talk about suspension setup. Okay, it's the hard points, it's the mass properties, it's a spring characteristic, damping characteristic. So basically you need the data from CAT system, if you wish, uh, from spring manufacturer, tire manufacturer is very important. Yeah, you need this data in order to make uh, your system system real. If the driver is also, maybe just adding this, this one thing, you asked uh, John earlier, what's the difference to the old days? I think the difference also is now, if you look at a company like Ford, they basically have optimized and automated their digital development process. So when it comes to make suspension setup, they have to they make sure the, the model and the data is ready. So I think that's that's very important, you know. If uh, the simulator is just for entertainment or entertainment of management, you can't make management uh, design decisions. Mm -hmm. But uh, Don, sorry, I was interrupting you. I was curious if the driver exceeds the limits of the vehicle, will it uh, will VI grade simulator roll over? No. <laughs> yeah, it can't roll over. <laughs> I think there are some safety safety limits built in. So basically, if you do certain things, so if the you know uh, you see there there are hydraulic cylinder, cylinders, uh, they have a uh, only a certain uh, working range. If you do things where you would get out of the, the working range, the system has a hard stop. And uh, then uh, it's up to you. Basically, you get a notification and then uh, you either start at the beginning or you say, okay, let me just rewind back, I don't know, 30 seconds or what you want. And then you continue from there. Thank you. Yeah. Is is the is the video monitor that is in the front is is that for entertainment reasons only or is it is it part of the development? It is. Uh, so what you what you see there, uh, for example, here the, the Goodyear. This is the Goodyear. Uh, I think it's uh, their test track. So it is not only <laughs> let's say what what we know from video games. So it's very, so basically the road roughness, so the unevenness, this is modeled, and then this will also influence how uh, the vehicle behaves. So basically the vertical dynamics, or uh, we talked about race cars when they drive on the, let's say the Nürburgring. So there's also the curves are modeled. And so that you also experience, okay, when you're uh, hitting a curve. So it's twofold. It is it, it gives you visual feedback, but then the X, Y, Z coordinates of the of the road determine how the vehicle behaves, and it determines basically, yeah, all the road input, if you wish. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I drove a couple of the simulators that you guys have at Multimatic. Uh, the, the one that's uh, the seat, and uh, the one that was just up there of the you know, part of the, the car body. And uh, so it, it's pretty realistic. So when, uh, you know, first they had me just driving down a highway and changing lanes to get the feel of things. Later on, they had me doing a slalom course uh, and then at, at higher and higher speeds. Uh, at one point I was doing laps at the Virginia International Raceway, VIR. Uh, and then they had me even going on a, a test track, a normal test track, and like going mm -hmm. over cobblestones, for example, on the test track yeah. feels exactly like, in fact, they told me, you better slow the whole thing down. 
to about 10 miles an hour, 12 miles an hour, you know, simulated 10 or 12 miles an hour. But the, the jolting in it was extremely realistic. And I, I, I think I, I didn't realize that before that you're able to take CAD data and feed that in. Uh, but also the modeling of the different tracks or highways or things like that. Uh, I think that's the, the real distance uh, difference between what's going on now and what might've been going on with uh, driving simulators in the past. They were far simpler, uh, not nearly as detailed. Now it's to a level where engineers literally can feel uh, different spring rates. But here's, here's my question, Michael, we're looking at, uh, at like the part of the, the cabin of a vehicle looks like part of a pickup cabin mm -hmm. before we saw the seat, just the, the seat that has it. And then uh, when I was at Multimatic, they showed me a desktop model mm -hmm. that, uh, so, so go through the different simulators and who uses what for what and wh why do you have just a seat and some and, and, a, and a full cabin around others? It, it, it depends what kind of, driving experience you, you want to examine. So for example, uh, take our, what we call our compact simulator. So there uh, you don't have these large dynamic movements. You use this simulator, just assume for a moment, you're developing an ADA system, lane keeping assistant. You know, for these kind of, when you develop these kind of system, it's important, what is the steering feel? You know, if you're, low, if you're not staying to your lane and then the computer brings you back and supposed to do this comfortably. So in order to test something like this, you don't have to race on the Nürburgring. It's basically, you need to look at the driving behavior, steering behavior. So that's a system where, where this is enough. Um, when you are a sound engineer, you know, sound designer, that's something important for uh, all the electric vehicles now, or even, even more important. Then it's more, okay, you, you may want to run it mostly on roads with different surfaces. And then you want to feel the vibrations in your seat on your hand, on the feet, and you want to listen to the sound. So again, this is not where you need this large simulator, which you see in my bag. Then it's called what, an NVH simulator. But then there are other things. Uh, you talked about this, what you did at Multimatics, lane change behavior. So um, what people then, when they, for example, they want to select the right tire. Then we talk about that this is an area where you want to have one-to-one -one behavior. It means you more or less realistically want to change one lane to the other lane. So this means you need to have a space of roughly three meters, you know, where the cabin moves. This is where you would move something like a simulator in the back. Mm -hmm. So these are maybe not all of our simulators, but you know, that's more or less, we're trying to have the right simulator for the right driving experience you want to, you want to investigate. So, so, so I have two questions for you. So, so the first one, you're talking about sound. So mm -hmm. does this require that someone drive whatever course or whatever surface it is and record that information that you then digitize and put into your system. And, and the other question is when we talk about simulation in the past, was it just an issue that you are dealing with so much data that you didn't have processors that could run all this? Um, answer your first question. Yes. This is how you usually start with sound. You measure. But then, uh, the, and this might not be the right <laughs> system to, to pick it here for, uh, for sound. It's basically you measure sound at different locations. And then there comes the software, which does some smart stuff, which is basically separating this into different components. You know, you have wind, wind noise, which is a speed dependent. 
You have road noise, which is also speed dependent. Uh, you have engine noise, which depends on your RPM. And you know, then you have a couple of these different sources. And this then what the simulator does, it brings it all together. It's, uh, I would say it's, it's more, let's say, faster computers always help. <laughs> but, but there I would say it is more, uh, yeah, the intelligence of the people uh, doing the math for this. And now skeptics could say, okay, you're talking about serial prototypes and now you talk about you need a lot of measurements. And you know, now the fun part also starts. Now you're trying to say, okay, maybe I now try a new car body with this different frequency behavior, different icon frequencies. And then you're introducing also the behavior of a computer model into this. And you're merging them. So that's the, this is the, the really the fun part of it. And Again, so not that we'll have all these quarters say uh, that's impossible today. So, so we still need a lot of measurements for particular sound. But I think there's also the, at least a way where we can see where you can introduce also more models uh, from the CAE side. So Michael, uh, when I was at uh... Multimatic and, and talking mm -hmm. to the VI grade people there, they said they gave me one example of uh, developing tires for a new car. And they said Goodyear would take, I don't know, probably hundreds of tires, fill up a couple of semi trucks, drive mm -hmm. down to their proving grounds in San Angelo, Texas. They'd have different cars and engineers running it, and, and it would take a lot of time, a lot of effort, mm -hmm. very high cost. But now they can do it all on the simulator. And so that's taken a tremendous amount of cost and time out of just tire selection. Uh, from a total product uh, development uh, standpoint, I mean, we're, we're hearing that you can take a year or two out of the time it takes to develop a, a new car just because you don't have to do so much testing in the real world and, and you don't have to build as many prototypes. I mean, how, how far can this go? How, how much time can come out and, uh, you know... Uh, Let's say it always depends, it depends on two things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it depends on how long your current process is uh -huh. and how much you can uh, you can squeeze there. What about uh, per percentage then? Percentage of... It, uh, yeah. Let me give you another example. I have to read the numbers so that I don't tell you something wrong. Uh, and also might address a little bit, uh, Gary, where you were saying, okay, uh, we may have skeptics out there. It's Idiata. Idiata, um, I'm not sure it's so well known in the US. No. So Idiata is a, a headquartered in Spain. They are a development and test organization. They have test tracks uh, in Europe and in China. Idiata did together with Mahindra developed a new uh, SUV. It was the first time Idiata used the simulator. So not like Ford, they're using it already a lot. So they used it the first time. And they were saying they uh, reduced the development time by 30%. And what I also like there, they gave us an overview. Let's say they looked at the maturity of their design. And uh, how much was done by offline simulation? How much additional maturity was uh, received through uh, the simulator? And what was left for test? And for example, and then they had categories like hard points, uh, bushings, springs, damper, and steering. And they said for hard points, CIE brought them 75%. They could get the remainder 25% through simulators. So they said hard points, 100% maturity achieved with the combination of offline and simulators. On the bushings, 
they got roughly, uh, what is it, 80% uh, through CAE and the remaining 20% through simulators. So basically, in nearly every category, they increased the majority by 20% using simulators. So, so when you say simulators, does this go back to what John was saying early about driver in the loop? So the simulator requires a human yes. being being yes. involved. Yes. And the CAE is just people are, are running numbers on, on processors. Exactly. exactly. Basically, CAE is where you do, if you wash this, you have maybe a driving robot and you do objective optimization. And when we, when we talk about the driving simulator, this is where the human is in the loop and brings uh, the, uh, yeah, the human experience in it. So uh, not that, you, that I'm giving you the wrong impression. For damping and steering, there still was a percentage left, which they said they need to test in order to get the 100% maturity. But I think doing this the first time on a simulator, I think it was, a, to me, it's a pretty, pretty impressive result. I, so, so that, that's... We're getting away from just using driving simulators for motorsports. Right. <laughs> no, it, you know, what you're talking about is, is huge. I mean, if you can first time out, take 30% out of your development time, that's huge. And I've heard some automakers talk about taking several years out of the time it takes to develop a new car. Yeah. And I, I don't know where it stands now, but years ago, the rule of thumb was in product development, it was $10 million every month. So the development costs really come down fast when you're able to use simulation. I, I know these simulators are expensive. Uh, the one that you've got with the part of the car body cabin in it, it's probably what, over a million dollars all in everything, right? But if if you can start taking months and months and maybe years out of the product development time, the savings are enormous. Plus you get to market so much faster. I think the, the, exactly. It's uh, so to be honest, uh, let's say when a customer really is seeing the potential of such a simulator doing an ROI, this is the, the smallest problem. <laughs> you know, there are other problems. It's unfortunately such a simulator needs space. You know, <laughs> just finding finding a building <laughs> where you can put the simulator. So, so unfortunately, infrastructure takes time. You know, if it were just for software, we can ship it overnight. But yeah. uh, such a simulator, okay, we need to assemble it. But I think the, the biggest bottleneck there is... Uh, in these companies, they need to find space uh, for, so, so, for the simulator. Yeah. So, so, Michael, who do you have to convince at an OEM that something like this is, is worth the investment? And number two, do traditional automakers have the people who are able to operate this? Or is this a situation where people from from VI grade have to come in and work with them for a long time. Whom do we have to convince? You know, uh, I think for these large investments, it's the head of engineering. You know, uh, what we're, we're talking about, okay, we're talking about a multi-million investment. So uh, this, yeah, we, we need to convince it at a higher level. Michael, you know, could you mention some of your OEM customers? Yeah, it's a, uh, let's say, if you look at the Detroit area, uh, all of them are, are our customers. Uh, it's a, uh, I think nearly, nearly every, every, uh, let's say, also if you look at Stellantis, if you look at BMW, Mercedes, and so on, uh, uh, or, uh, or Honda in Japan, uh, and other customers, you know, uh, from the racing team, they often do, are not so pleased when we tell their name. So, <laughs> about Hyundai Group. Bit, sorry, Honda, yeah. Hun Hyundai, not Honda. Hyundai. Are they a customer? Yes. So, uh, if you just want to. 
you know, I can tell you a lot. <laughs> but I think the best thing to, to, to get, get direct feedback from our customers is to go to our YouTube channel and enter ZPS. So these are our zero prototype summits. And there you can listen to, to customers. For example, at the last one we had in, uh, in Italy, we had presentations from Hyundai, from GM, from Volvo, from Pirelli, from Bridgestone, uh, from Goodyear, and, and others. It's, uh, so I apologize for the ones which I now forgot. Uh, uh, Lamborghini. <laughs> Did I say GM? Yes. So, yeah. So uh, but, uh, look, I think you were you were asking about uh, the, the, your second question, Gary was. Do about we, people. Do our, do our customers have the, the right people? And, you know, a company like Ford or GM, they have a lot of smart people and they can do it. But uh, let's say when you talk to small, smaller companies, we may have to uh, support them. And, and that's basically... Uh, we offer something there, what we call the acceleration program. You know, I talked about this, getting such a simulator takes time. And now, uh, and when we get a, an order, then we prepare the customer so that once their building is ready and our simulator stands there, they can have immediately becoming productive. So basically we then invite them to our sim centers. So John has been at, at the Multimatics uh, site. So basically then the Multimatics engineers prepare them and train them. So once the simulator is there, they can use it. So that's the training program. But in general, we are flexible. So we also, uh, if the customer prefers this, we build a zero prototype lab for them and we operate it. You know, it's, you can ask, or OEM could ask themselves, should it be their core competency to run a simulator farm or shouldn't they develop their competences on developing vehicles? So we are flexible. So we're also offering companies, okay, we, we also bring the people, and so then you can concentrate on developing cars. But I think that's a matter of taste and what, what companies prefer. Mm -hmm. Hey, look, uh, we're going to have to wrap this segment up. Uh, but thanks for coming on, Michael. Th this is fascinating. And, uh, you know, I, I think our, our viewers should know that this is becoming very common in the industry. And uh, it's it's revolutionary, really. It, it's probably had more impact on shrinking the product development time than any other technology I've ever seen in, in the course of my career. And, and as I, you know, talked about before, the more time you take out, the more cost you take out as well. So it's a, it's a win, win, win all the way around for the industry. Mm -hmm. So thanks let again me, for coming on, Michael. Yeah. Let me, let me just, before, before you chart sure, me go off, ahead and yeah. make it more commercial for our zero prototype summit, because I think it's a unique opportunity. It's so what we do there is in the morning you can drive simulators. In the afternoon, you can listen to customer presentations. So you can have your own trying experience and talk to customers and figure out whether this is real what I have been talking to you. So when is your summit? It's the next one is uh, uh, in, in May in uh, in Italy. And uh, the, the one in uh, Michigan is uh, later in the year. I think it's it's fall. Okay, but if they go to the VI Grade website, they can find that info. Yeah. Yes. Very good. And you know, May in Italy. <laughs> we, can, we can combine it with, with a trip to Venice, so it's close yeah. by. I think that's the best combination. Oh no, no, no! But they'll they'll be inside in the simulator the entire time. It, it doesn't matter where it's at. <laughs> Okay. That's great. It was nice, nice talking to you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks okay. again, Michael. We're going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to come back and talk a lot about the E-Ray Corvette. Thank you.
Right. How do Bridgestone tires stop shorter on wet roads? It's their hydro track technology. But you don't have to know how the science works. Just where the brake is. What really matters is their Bridgestone. All right, and we're back. Talking all things automotive here, but Don Sherman, you've got some more info on this Corvette E-Ray. My, my first question to you, though, is what do you think of this car overall? What, what, what's your reaction to them doing a hybrid Corvette? Let me uh, reveal that I haven't enjoyed a ride-along or test drive yet, so I'm fairly early in that process. Uh, GM did host... Uh, many journalists uh, last week, I believe it was, uh, with uh, such uh, opportunities at various locations, including New York and and Michigan. But uh, from what I've learned thus far from uh, Executive Chief Engineer Tad Jupiter and Chief Engineer Josh Holder, I'm very impressed by it. And I my frame of reference is that I own a 2020 uh, C8 Corvette bought it early very early in the process so i i do love almost everything about that car i'm a little cool on both interior and exterior design but as far as driving it's uh, absolutely brilliant what, what don't you like about the design it's uh overwrought with creases and folds uh and ports too much detail i selected a uh a charcoal gray uh, exterior color in hopes uh, some of those would blend in better, and, and they do. And uh, you, you're familiar with the inside. It's got the bundling board uh, down the middle to separate uh, your co-passenger from the driver. I think that's a little intimidating to a lot. It's functional in that there's switch gear mounted there, which is convenient, but... Uh, I would uh, prefer a more open feeling uh, cockpit myself. Mm -hmm. so, so Don, so, so our, our viewers and listeners know, I mean, you not only own a Corvette, but out of all the journalists, I think John and I know you have been covering Corvette more carefully than anyone for a number of years. You've, you've, generation after generation after generation. I mean, you've, you've had deep dives into these vehicles. So what do you know about the rationale behind doing a hybrid? Was this something that they thought about early on when the C8 was being developed, or is this something that came further after you know the, the model year 2020 was launched? Small correction, I own two Corvettes. I also own a 67 uh, big block roadster, which I restored. And Love dear, dearly, but uh, from the beginning of C8, uh, a hybrid was considered, and you can tell by the backbone space frame hollow down the middle, intended for uh, battery pack storage, uh, and and today's space frame for E-Ray is basically common to Stingray and Z06. So yes. Eight years ago, when development commenced and, and design, they were thinking of options, you know, optional models. And as you well know, there will be several, several of them before they get to C9. So it was planned ahead. And one of the most brilliant features of the car is that structural uh, hollow where the battery cells go. Fits the car nicely and uh, sacrifices no trunk or tr trunk space. Don, you know, th there's a number of people that wonder, why didn't they just go full battery electric? What do you, what are your thoughts along that? Um, I b firmly believe they will go that way when the time is right. And uh, you've heard of the new uh, Gen 6 V8 in the offing. Uh, while um, electrification is well underway, there's still ample life left in uh, ICE powertrains. And uh, 
for example, Z06, 670 horsepower, the uh, LT7 V8 to follow, more like 750 horsepower thanks to twin turbos. So it's, it's too soon to send the V8 engine to the rest home, especially the small block uh, Chevrolet engine. So, I mean, given, given that, Don, the, given that, that, you know, just pure ice, non-electrified versions can get that sort of performance, I mean, it comes back to the question of, okay, so why bother with a hybrid? I mean, that's the only hybrid that General Motors offers. Um, it's because it extends the performance envelope for Corvette. It adds uh, all-weather capability whether that's an accident or intentional, like you went to work and it was sunny uh, outside and yesterday's storm uh, befell us. You weren't paying attention to weather reports where you can get home in, in an E-ray without any issue whatsoever. Uh, also, it's obviously got four wheel drive or all wheel drive. That's a way to add uh, acceleration potential uh, and to some extent, cornering potential over uh, Z06. In fact, uh, E Ray is a tenth quicker to 60 than uh, Z06, in spite of its about 300 pounds uh, extra weight added. So, all wheel drive is, is a breakthrough for Corvettes. It's the first one, and they're using it very intelligently, and uh, it's, be it's better to drive. Uh, especially for someone that doesn't have uh, race driver skills to uh, keep track of uh, the Z06 prowess. <laughs> hey, Don, we got a question here from one of our viewers, Kit Gerhardt, and he says, please ask Dr. Sherman this question. Uh, is all the charging of the E-Ray battery through the, fr uh, the front wheels? Because he says when it was first announced, he thought maybe there was a motor generator connected to the engine, but he didn't find anything about that. No motor generator on engine. Uh, the transaxle is changed only to add an electric hydraulic pump so you can uh, operate things uh, with the engine disabled and shut down. You can still uh, declutch it and whatever you need to do in addition to the engine driven uh, pump on, on it. Otherwise, it's basically a carryover a Tremec. Mm -hmm. Does it does it have any pure electric range, or is it is is the engine always have to be operating? Well, there's a, a mode called stealth, where you can both back out of the garage and drive away from home on your way to work in the morning with the uh, combustion engine off. Works both forward and reverse to stop the ruckus uh, of the vociferous uh, V8 uh, so you don't rile up your neighbors uh, every morning when you leave. Uh, and the charging, I didn't answer that very correctly. Uh, there's regen uh, during braking. There's um, charging that's achieved by, uh, if, if the engine's putting out a little bit more than the uh, driver actually requested, which can happen, uh, the, the motivation of the car uh, is driving that front electric motor, which charges, recharges the battery. And I, I know that you can drive up to 45 miles an hour in pure EV mode, but it's only a, a 1.9 kilowatt hour battery. So I, I don't think you can go very far in just pure EV mode. Uh, that's the stealth mode I mentioned. Yeah. And uh, that's true. And um, there, there are limitations because the battery pack uh, isn't that huge. In fact, out of that 1.9, they actually only use 1.1. The capacity, as you probably realize, uh, no hybrid pack is used to its full limit to preserve its life, extend its life. Mm -hmm. um, and one uh, instance described to me by Josh Holder was you're making a, a quarter mile acceleration run and uh, with help from the uh, electric motor 
which is 160 horsepower to achieve maximum performance. Well, uh, yes, it does consume most of the battery, but on the way back, the return run uh, is enough to recharge it so you make the next uh, pass uh, with full performance. Don, there's a, a charge plus mode that keeps the battery up for consistent lapping. I, I didn't get that. What's that all about? Charge plus is, uh, I think I've heard the term. I believe that's where that, where the engine is putting out a little more than the driver requested through the accelerator pedal during which the uh, motor acts as a generator to replenish the battery. So when you talk to the engineers that were involved in the program, um, were they enthusiastic about this? I mean, did they, were they really geeked up about this or were they just like, ah, we had to have one of these. And so we developed it. They are truly geeked up. They call it their Swiss army knife. It's so versatile and so easy to drive. Um, I think they, they love it uh, as much as Z06 or anything else. And, um, you know, it's a lot of work to, make two uh, drive lines perform uh, together in a friendly way. But I, 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 like I say, I haven't driven it yet, but they believe they've, they've achieved that. So th this is uh, priced a little over $104,000. Uh, it's, it's not much uh, less expensive than Z06. Mm -hmm. And my conclusion from that, is that GM realized that uh, C8 uh, Stingray was not uh, expensive enough from the get-go. And, you know, th these cars are Ferraris. They're, there's no making, uh, there's no excuses for them whatsoever. They're Ferraris and Lamborghinis at affordable prices. My 2020, I could sell it today for more than I paid for it. And, and they're they're genuinely sold out. There are waiting lists to get a Stingray. There's fights over Z06s. There's the issue of uh, uh, cars being flipped. You you lose the warranty if you sell it too soon. There's the issue over dealers taking uh, over list uh, to to actually sell you one. So it it's a high value car, and I believe that's why. Nobody said this. It's just my conclusion. That's why uh, E-Ray cost uh, a bit over a hundred thousand dollars. So, so Don, did did C8 then change the game for Corvette in a way that it it now is in more the supercar class than it might have otherwise have been in C7 and C6? Well, there were hot six and sevens uh, ZR1s and supercharged uh, V8s and things. So they were knocking on the door, but I think they're truly there now with, with no question whatsoever. But I mean, you're talking about, the, I'm, I'm talking about like the whole vehicle from, you know, the, the, the design, the execution, the materials, the well, performance. I mean, not just, you know, I mean, there are lots of fast cars out there that are just like, well, they're fast cars, um, but you, you wouldn't compare them to. A hint of history. Uh, Zorarkis Duntoff concluded in 1957 that mid-engine was the way to go. Initially, because of heat, they raced the, the Corvette SS at Sebring. It cooked John Fitch. He couldn't stand the heat of a magnesium body with uh, eight exhaust pipes wrapped around the cockpit. So I went to Zora's house once with that one question. Why were you so fascinated with uh, mid-engine, and you remember all the serve experiments he did, and that was the initial reason. And being in Germany in the 30s, he witnessed uh, auto unions with uh, a mid-engine layout versus the Mercedes uh, Grand Prix cars of the day. So he, he was well aware with that, but the auto unions were very difficult to handle. You did have to be almost superhuman to keep them keep the uh, front wheels ahead of the rear. So w when uh, Corvette moved to mid-engine, they finally joined that supercar club with no question whatsoever uh, with the engine placed over the drive wheels with the low polar, polar moment of inertia, those features. 
in a more pointy, leaner front end. Uh, so I, I, I think even Ferrari would agree that uh, it belongs there, uh, whether or not it costs as much. Uh, let me mention one other thing. There's, there are a lot of Corvette potential customers. Uh, to them, the word hybrid is a dirty word. They think of uh, uh, cheap economy cars like Toyota Prius when they hear hybrid. So they're, they're skeptical. That's why a Z06 is their car. I have one of them up the street who's a wealthy uh, uh, owner of a supplier business to the auto industry, and he's quite anxious for his Z06. I shared with him uh, E-Ray information. He was not the least bit interested. And <laughs> the, the last C8 will be a car called Zora. And it will top 1,000 horsepower. This isn't confirmed. It's speculative, but it's totally credible. And it will be a hybrid. I think that car will help change his mind. That car is going to, I predict, get up into the Ferrari price range with 1,000 horsepower and all-wheel drive uh, at its disposal. So, Don, who do you think is going to buy the E-Ray? Um, well, Josh Holder, chief engineer, calls it their Swiss Army knife. So it's people who want the speed without uh, going to racing driver school or spending a lot of time learning on the track. Uh, people who want the, the maximum available performance uh, without mentioning hybrid. They want uh, the, the technology of the day. And it's got uh, uh, six... Let's see, 495 in back and 160 in front. So you add that up and you've got a, a pretty much serious performer. You're showing the the uh, double blue stripe job. So there's some some design features that are available. There's uh, lots of colors. There's tech like uh, Brembo brakes as standard equipment to uh, save weight. So I think it's like they say, a Swiss Army knife and very appealing from um, many directions. Would you buy one? Um, you're not paying me enough to, to afford that other high <laughs> pay price. Uh, okay, uh, if you had the money, would you take that or would you take a Z06? I think I would wait for Zora, to be honest oh, with you. Yeah. And of course, I'm ignor totally ignorant of the price. That car could be two hundred thousand dollars, and even further beyond my uh, price range. But I had two uh, heroes in life. One is Bernd Rosemeyer, who was an accomplished pilot on those mid-engine uh, auto unions, and the other is Zora Arcus Duntov. So, I'd love to own a car named after him. Yeah. I, I'll bet you're right. I'll bet it is in Ferrari price range. I think, you know, uh, the C8 and even with the COVID stuff and where car prices won, I think uh, the industry and probably Corvette program in general realize they can take a lot more pricing than they ever have. I, I believe that to be true. And Mark Royce is perhaps the uh, greatest supporter behind uh all of the C8s, and he's uh, a performance enthusiast from the start as well. So that's what I want to ask you, Don. Do you think that, I mean, over the years, there have always been some speculation that Corvette would cease to exist. And, do, I mean, do you think that this completely solidifies Corvette as being something that is essentially a part of General Motors? And added to that, the perennial question, will it become a mark onto itself and split off from Chevy? Well, I've uh, heard that speculation and I believe Royce has already announced that they're so-called fully electrified. He didn't call them beds, but uh, there are near future products that will wear a Corvette badge and might be sitting on an Altium platform, not as a sports car because that platform really doesn't work when you want the driver's uh, butt skimming the pavement. But a coupe, uh, uh, a stylish SUV, that's what I believe uh, this speculation about 
uh, Corvette being. Yeah, no, let, hey, let's get specific. I mean, I, I think it's fairly, I'm confident in saying there's going to be a Corvette SUV and it's going to be LTM base and it's going to get built in Lansing, Michigan. You're probably right. My, uh, my wife owns a, um, Mustang Mach-E, and while there was uh, great disgust over uh, appropriating the Mustang badge to some, that's been a fantastic uh, family vehicle. It does two things superbly well. One is obviously it drives by gas stations with a wave. And two, when you line up with a Mustang at the stoplight who hates you, the driver hates absolutely hates you, you smoke him. We've done it repeatedly, and they doubly hate you, but it's quicker because <laughs> instant torque. We happen to have the two-motor uh, four-wheel drive, so you could even do it in the wet. Yeah, well, Gary, to, to Gary's point, don't you think the Corvette brand could stand on its own? They could expand the range and make a lot of money. I think so. Um, uh, yes, uh, stretching the... The badge too much uh, will probably uh, not be pleasant for classic Corvette owners, but I think what you're saying is inevitable as uh, a money making and you know just a, a path for General Motors and Chevrolet to exploit. But sure. but would it be Chevrolet, or I mean, would this be taken out of Chevrolet? Because I mean, if you go to a Chevy dealer and you see you know, equinoxes and traverses and, and things like that. I mean, somehow the, the Corvette just doesn't fit. It's true. And I reference the Genesis, which is making a successful break from Hyundai dealerships with its own stand standalone franchises because it's upscale. Uh, it They put uh, different uh, graphics and decorations on the wall and instead of a um elantra connection they're often running against uh true luxury cars and corvette can do the same thing exactly but but, the same thing. but but genesis wasn't part of hyundai for 50 years and corvette has been part of chevy for 50 years so there's that issue of like does that play um we're going to have to wait and see, but I think uh, Corvette's worthy of making the break, and I think its customers will not be upset by that. Uh, Chevrolet dealers might not be so thrilled, but uh, <laughs> again, uh, we're just going to have to wait and see, and it's probably going to happen. Yeah, John, do you think that if, if they took Corvette out of Chevy that, that General Motors would have to pay the dealers? No, I mean, uh, some some Chevrolet dealers would actually be offered a Corvette franchise. Not all of them, you know, but the biggest and the best would absolutely have first dibs on it. And uh, I, I think it can be done. You know, I look, Porsche taught the industry that you expand the model range. And as long as you're coming out with great product, you can make you can sell a lot more cars and make a ton of money, which Porsche does. And I think GM has uh, has. Missed the boat up to now. I, I think it could have done this some time ago, but now's the the, the right time to do it. Uh, I I believe they're probably thinking about it. But Don, I think you're right. They're going to wait wait until the time is right. They're they're not going to rush into this. Well, Chevrolet dealers as a bone will be given lots of electric products. In a, most in most cases, they'll cost more. A Silverado pickup truck, whatever, and. Uh, Hopefully there'll be a greater profit potential with that to help compensate for loss of Corvette. Yeah. Hey, look, we're at the, the top of the hour. We ought to wrap it up, but Don, it's been great having you on the show. Fascinating what you know about this program. And thanks for sharing that with us. You're quite welcome. I enjoyed it. And uh, I love to speculate on Corvettes. <laughs> Good deal. <laughs> you know a lot about it. <laughs> okay. Thanks you guys. Uh, Gary, you and I will be back next week, and I want yep. to thank everyone for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey.
If you like this program and would like to learn more about the automotive industry, check out our website at Autoline.tv or look for us on YouTube on the Autoline channel.